Tonight on Bill Green's Maine, we'll be on the Penobscot at the Whitewater Nationals Regatta. I'm pumped. I feel really tired. <laughs> tired too. <laughs> yeah. We'll be at Princeton where two-time Olympic gold medalist Ellie Logan is preparing to attempt to make Olympic history. I've always been so shocked with all the support that the state of Maine has shown me. And we'll be in Bangor at Beans to hear how the Red Snapper came to be. So we all have to to Join us now for Bill Green's Maine. Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to Bill Green's Maine. We spend a lot of time on this show covering recreational and outdoor sports, and we had a special event recently as we covered the Penobscot Nation hosting the Penobscot River Whitewater Nationals Regatta. All heats two minutes apart. There's special excitement to a canoe race. One, go! You might know the water, but you never know what it's going to offer. Jenny Goldberg came from Seattle to win a national championship. I think it's absolutely wonderful that the river is open. It's a wonderful resource, so easy access and really warm water, something we don't have in Washington. Um, it's great, a little bit of rapids, but not too hard, so everyone can enjoy it. The races were put on by the Penobscot Nation, which is celebrating the restoration of the river, which is its namesake and lifeblood. These rapids were not paddled for 150 years. The removal of the Great Works and VZ Dams returned the river to its free-flowing state. With race director Scott Phillips, we paddled the nine and a half mile course from Old Town to Eddington. He loves exploring rips and pools that have been lost for generations. The river's been opened up after taking the dams out, so now we have this beautiful river to paddle and to race. So it was very new for not only the locals, but people from away to come up and paddle. Hannah Rubin just earned a spot on our national whitewater team. She would win the junior national championship on the Penobscot. Before the dams were removed, this was just spot water, just a lake. And now we have some awesome rapids. And it's different every time you paddle it because the water level changes so much and it, the Penobscot is such a wide river. so. It never gets old. We made a stop at Blackman Stream to see another sign of river cleanup. Alewives by the thousands are returning to their spawning grounds along the Penobscot. These herrings serve as a bait fish for larger species, such as endangered salmon, which it is hoped will return to the river in great numbers. But the cleanup is not complete. Refuse left from two centuries of log drives remain. And a spike on that log over there. A spike on a log, which came from an old logging boom, caught the canoe of Terry Westcott, who cleverly used grasses to plug the gash and enable himself to get downstream. Did it work? I made it. <laughs> <laughs> it's still leaking slightly, but not like it used to be. You guys trying to go there? This is a community of friends. Former Commissioner of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Bucky Owen was among three generations of his family that paddled. Absolutely. It's it's wonderful. We love it. <laughs> when you get together, it's wonderful to get together, but you have to work, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we don't work quite as hard as we used to. <laughs> <laughs> and if you'd like trivia, check this. Bob Martin placed third in his age group. I worked for Bob as a canoe assembler at Rivers and Gilman in Hamden way back in 1971. I was probably one of the better canoe builders you've ever oh, seen. Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, we had a good time back then I today. I don't see any of those Rivers and Gilman's boats around. There's a few. Are there? I actually have one. Do you? The old 13-footer. <laughs> yeah, you added dirt to your head. <laughs> if, if, if the bank plate is a little crooked, it's one I did. Yeah. That's <laughs> a, that's For the Penobscot Nation, this is especially meaningful. The Whitewater Nationals Regatta is a perfect way to celebrate a nation's lifeblood returning, and it's appropriate that people are reveling in it. It was a thrill to get out and paddle a stretch of that refreshed river. Time now for our trivia question, and it is, what is the traditional Saturday night supper 
in Maine? We'll have that answer later on, but next we're going to Princeton University where Ellie Logan is getting ready to make Olympic history. Stay tuned as Bill Green's Maine continues. One of the pleasures of this job is I meet just about everybody who comes down the main turnpike. This next person is special indeed. She is bright, she is interesting, and she is one great athlete. The Rowing Center at Princeton University looks idyllic in the early morning light. Here is America's best, and the best of them all might be Ellie Logan of Booth Bay Harbor, who's trying to become the first American woman to win three gold medals in this sport. And it's an opportunity she's not taking lightly. Really all it is is just an opportunity, and everyone else likes to put other, float other words out there, um, but all you have is an opportunity, and that's, you know, what you do with it is up to you. Eleanor Logan was born in Portland and grew up in Booth Bay Harbor. At 6'2", 175, you can pick her out on the dock as a formidable rower. In a sport that is all legs, she has 38-inch inseams. She performs in what is called the engine room of the eights with coxswain, the glamour boat in this competition. I am definitely taking with me everything I've learned from the past two Olympics and from the teammates and the experiences I've had because um, I've learned so much from them and they're just my role models, every teammate I've had. So I'm taking each and every one of them in my head and I'm just trying to enjoy the moment. She learned how to row at prep school in Massachusetts and went on to Stanford where she was so successful that she has been named the rower of the century in the Pac-12 conference. In part because of her success, her sport has become more popular. More women are rowing, and they are better than those who rowed with her in Beijing in 2008 and London in 2012. Let me put it this way. In 2008, there was, I think, a couple people trying to get in the last spot for the boat. This year, there's uh, two eight worths of people who didn't make the team and all could have, easily have made the team, they're that good. And they grew up watching her. Our stroke right now, she's the youngest one on the team and she's always telling me how she watched us at the 2008 Olympics or the 2012 and how it was so exciting for her and sometimes I forget, um, you know, sure. from that perspective. There is concern about the health of athletes going to Rio because of the Zika virus and pollution in the water. Our junior rowing team competed there last year and there were some issues, but Elle downplays them, saying there are issues everywhere they compete. So there's always something. Of course, we're gonna take every precaution that we can um, and we're not gonna go swimming and we're not gonna drink the water and we're gonna take it step by step, but really focus on what we can control. Now married and 28 years old, Elle does not know if she will attempt another Olympic cycle in the big boat. She got away from the eights for a couple of years after London. I'm not done rowing. I'll never be done rowing because we're going to be rowing in the fall together. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, But to be able to be here, you have to wake up every morning and say, no matter what, I'm going to give 100% mentally, physically, spiritually, and if you're not willing to do that, then you shouldn't be here. Elle Logan should be here. She is the quiet, respected leader who strengthens the others with her confidence in what is unquestionably the big race in this sport. Especially for a sport like rowing, and I know other sports that don't get a lot of other opportunities, this is, this is our big race every four years. Um, this is what we train for. We have world championships, every other year that we're not at the Olympics. But there's something about racing at the Olympics that in the rowing world, that's it. It's, it's like the World Cup for, of soccer. After the Olympics, Elle will take some time off to relax and row a bit in Maine this fall. It's a chance to spend some time with the people who support her most. The past two Olympics, um, I've always been so shocked with all the support that the state of Maine has 
shown me and it's just been so wonderful. Um, and there's always this, I'm always focused on the day to day and my rowing and then it's at that moment where I just feel so proud to represent the United States and the state of Maine. Ellie Logan is one of Maine's most successful athletes all time. Now she takes her amazing talent to Rio to try to do something that no American woman has ever done before. We wish Ellie Logan all the best as she goes for Olympic history by becoming the first American woman to win three gold medals in rowing. Well, when we come back, we're gonna look back at another little award winner. It's Cal the Lobster. Stay tuned as Bill Green's Maine continues. As you know, the third part of the show always comes out of the archives, and this time we're going to go to last year and pull one of our favorite stories. It involves Cal the Lobster, who got caught, got freed, but got caught again. One late August day, Scott Hoyt was out in Pepperell Cove aboard his boat, Slow Motion. He had no idea something was lurking down below. In one of his traps was a very special lobster. And when he hauled it up, he saw something strange. He saw that it was yellow. I was just, I was like, wow, that's, never seen that before. So he called his wife Charlene and he said, You should see this lobster I got. I said, I got a, I got a yellow calico lobster. Charlene teaches math over at Berwick Academy. She had a different reaction than her husband. He's a little underwhelmed. You know, he thought it was cool, but it's also $3.50 a pound. Right. He wanted to sell him. And I said, no, we can't sell him. We have to give him to somebody. It turns out Cal was the perfect addition to the grammar school touch tank. For the whole month of September, he was feasting on jumbo shrimp. I brought him here so that the kids could play with him and he could be a tool for learning, you know, for math, for science, because he's a genetic um, abnormality. Freak. He's, a freak. he's a freak. But as the kids learned, Charlene started feeling sad for Cal. He was trapped in a tank with his claws and elastic bands. And that's when she decided to do something no lobsterman's wife should do. She decided to free Cal. But it did feel weird. It felt, um, it felt sneaky. So on the 1st of October, she let Cal go. She put him in a shopping bag and went over to the wharf. No one was around. And we looked at each other for a while and, and then, and it was actually a pretty strong feeling. It really actually was. I let him go and I washed him because he's yellow. You, I could see him for a long, long time and he just kind of kept fluttering down and then he disappeared. <sighs> and life went on and no one knew for three days. That's when Scott went lobstering again. Up comes this lobster, this yellow lobster. I look in there and I look at my son. I say, hey, look at that. We got another one. And I went, hold on a second. It's not the same lobster. I could tell by the claw. Charlene was at the grocery store when Scott called. And he doesn't call very often, and so I answered it right away. I said, hello, and he said, where's Cal? <laughs> I immediately knew I was busted. She goes, why? I said, what did you do with the lobster? And she says, why? I said, because I just caught it again. <laughs> and that's when she finally, she fessed up that she went down on the dock and let it go. Scott understood her fondness for Cal. Rather than sell him for three fifty or maybe even five bucks, Scott skippered Charlene out past Whaleback Light because he's not just a lobsterman, he's a husband too. Whatever she wants to do, it's fine with me. There Charlene ceremoniously dropped Cal into a rock bed where he'll have protection for, well, knowing Cal three or four days. People are sort of um, hinting about the fact that he wanted to come back to eat jumbo shrimp and to have kids play with him all day. So Scott and Charlene are happy, Cal is free, and we'll let you know if he swims back into one of Scott's traps. I think what makes that story work so well is that every time Scott and Charlene speak, they're smiling and it draws us in. Their love is infectious and it makes that story charming indeed and we feel that way because we won an Emmy for best light feature in New England with Cal the Lobster. Thank you Scott and Charlene. When we come back we're going to have the story of the Red Snapper. Stay tuned as Bill Green's Maine continues.
Time now to answer our trivia question. Early in the show, we asked you, what is the official main Saturday night supper? And I say it's baked beans, brown bread, and a couple of hot dogs. If you're from Maine, you probably want those hot dogs to be red snappers because we don't like hot dogs from away. It might be fair to say we don't know any better. Or it's what we grew up with. But there's no doubt about it. Mainers from Portland to Millinocket prefer red snapper hot dogs. They're made here in Bangor at W.A. Bean and Sons where David Bean and Fred Wright have partnered to keep the Red Snappers coming off the line. Mm. So we all have to take Oh my God, that was good. We were business competitors, but we were always friendly. We, we had a very, uh, a very good relationship with, with the Rice family. If you want proof of that, check this. A photo from the Bangor Sausage Works in 1898. It was the type of market where folks bought fresh meat every few days or so. The various vendors posed out front, and Charlie Rice brought out his dog and stood next to Wesley Bean. 115 years later, their descendants have partnered to keep the Red Snapper going. I think, wow, where is all the time going? Hot dogs seem pretty simple. There's nothing bad in a hot dog. They're all lean meat. It's, it's pork and beef, and that's it. We don't put any byproducts or anything else in, so they're very, they're a very good product. David and Fred showed me the process. It looked kind of like bread dough. However, just like Colonel Sanders, they wouldn't tell me about the secret herbs and spices. It was exactly the same. The same spice, the same formula. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that we've had get locked in the safe, but uh, the spices the exactly the same. And uh, W.A. Bean picked up that form formula that I gave them, and they're making that exactly the same recipe that was started really in the 1940s. The spice recipe was developed by a German man named Paul Sussenbach. He had been a German submariner when he surfaced at the end of World War II. My great-grandfather, after World War II, found out that there were some German sausage makers that had landed in New York City as prisoners of war. He went down and interviewed two or three of them, several of them, and hired one of them, brought him back to Bangor, Maine, to reformulate the sausage and the old-fashioned German sausage recipe. A number of companies dyed their hot dogs red. It was kind of a main thing. Rice is sold to Jordans in 62, Jordan's bought Kirstner's, and then, right after the turn of the century, Tyson bought the whole thing. They shut down the Rice's brand and moved the whole operation to Buffalo. People started calling Fred to say they couldn't get their red snappers anymore. I wrote the letter to the president of Tyson, and he didn't call, but he had his vice president give me a call of marketing the next week. So it was a quick response, quick return. So they were good to do business with. Tyson? Yes. Looking for some good vibes up in the pine tree state. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So Fred Rice went to David Bean in 2004 to see if he would manufacture Rice's hot dogs. He did, and within six months, his business tripled. Mainers want that red snapper, which snapped because of a natural casing. Now this is the hard part. An artificial casing might be cellulose or plastic. A natural casing is made from sheep intestines. Well, a natural casing is, uh, that's where you get the snap, you know, that, that's what people are always looking for in a red hot dog. When they are from, they've moved away or, or they want us to, to ship them some hot dogs, this is what they always refer to. They want those hot dogs with a snap. So it looks like the red snapper is here to stay. They are a huge seller in northern and down east Maine and southern Maine is figuring it out. You know, just by being local there, people are much more interested in buying local product now. They even, they go to the grocery store and they're, they're looking for something that's made in the state of Maine. Something that's, it's got Maine people that are doing the work and it's locally made and produced. It's a fresh product and, and I think it's very important to, uh, to especially Maine shoppers. <laughs> the Red Snapper is important to Maine, especially with a little mustard, relish, and maybe some onions. So that's baked beans, brown bread, Red Snappers, and we hope Bill Green's Maine. <laughs>
Don't forget to download our app so you can follow us streaming wherever you may go and like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Bill Greens Maine. Kids, remember, don't go bragging just because you're from Maine. And we hope to see you next Saturday night at 7 for more editions of Bill Greens Maine. You have like all these different kinds of Pokemon that you can get. Yeah. And you can either evolve them or find them. And so what happens at the end? Does it end or it just goes on forever? Apparently it just goes on forever, but it's- How old are you now? I'm gonna be 26. So in 24 years and you're turning 50, you're gonna still be- Probably. Probably, probably all right. walking around with my son doing that. You have a very bright future ahead of you. Congratulations. <laughs> No, it's fun. Everybody's doing it. Those it ladies. Is. You get a lot of different kinds of Pokemon, and it's actually getting everybody out. Like, there's never been this many people down here. Getting everybody what? Out of there. Out, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, you there get points for the more miles you walk, yeah. right? Um, you have eggs you have to hatch, which you have to go by kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a five, a two, and a ten. Yeah. I think the ten you have to do like six and a half miles okay. in order to do it. But then you've got the other Pokemon, but you get multiples. I've got three of this one. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you have Stardust, which will help power them up, which makes them stronger. Yeah. Or you get the candies, which helps you evolve them. Fun. Yeah. That's what we do all day. <laughs> <laughs>